Good morning everyone, or good afternoon, it's afternoon here in the UK, um, loads of, where are you at, You're, loads of you in Europe um, today actually, funny enough, loads of you in the UK as well, Newcastle, London, uh, South Coast, uh, lots of you up early including Jerry in Arizona, Jerry you do indeed get a spare hall, hall pass um, for, for making up for last week, um, what else have we got, uh, Tucson, San Diego, cool, okay, so good morning or afternoon or good evening everyone depending on where you are um, for those that are familiar with these sessions you know that there is about a 15 second lag between what you type if you type in any comments and what we see here um, that's just the way that unfortunately streaming works so um, feel free to chip in as we go along but just bear in mind I'm not ignoring you we're just catching up um, with some of the comments as they go through um, so let's get started first off with the basics um, some of you are going to be uh, very used to these so um, the version of capture one that we're using capture one 20 uh, that version is the current version um, there's absolutely no uh, sorry one second just going to check the microphones were a little bit quiet today for some reason that may be better um, so you may be able to hear us better now um, so the version is capture one 20 uh, that's the version that was updated in May to 20.1 please make sure you're using the latest version if you are using the latest version then you're fine if not get updated to 20.1 or 13.1 uh, depending on where you look at it because it's got lots of bug fixes in um, that fix some of the issues that came out with the initial version 20 okay uh, secondary thing um, we're moving so those of you that are joining us on Facebook um, you'll see that we've created a fun little group um, this is to keep it away from the main photography page um, which are just trying to split some of the chat away from photographers um, versus people that want to buy prints um, and workshops and so on so there is a new group on Facebook um, where the live broadcast will still be they'll be held there um, and stored there so you'll have the whole library um, in there to view but that group um, allows a lot more discussion afterwards. So, you know, we can upload pictures, we can have a little bit of fun with um, some of the, the techniques and so on that we cover in these sessions. So if you wanna have a look, go to that group um, rather than the page, you'll still get a warning from the page um, saying we're going live, so you won't miss anything. The events will still be on the page, but the group is a lot more interactive and that's where we're gonna be posting stuff going forward in the future. Uh, and then finally, before we go into Capture One itself, um, just so you're all on the same page, there are two things coming up um, that are both online events. So this Thursday, 2nd of July, um, you all get to see me if you choose. Um, there's a little bit of a talking head, um, but we're doing a special session with the guys at Teamwork um, Digital in London, who are one of the Phase One partners. Um, that's focusing purely on the phase one iq4 system so that's the 151 megapixel camera and the functions like dual pixel uh, sorry dual exposure uh, and frame averaging and so on and how to get the best out of editing those so if you want to have a look at what's going on uh, in the future or if you have a phase one kit um, join in on thursday and then following that we've got next tuesday is the next one of these um, so send in all of your extra images that we haven't got to necessarily uh, by tuesday next week and we'll cover them there. Okay, that's it. Let's load up Capture One. Um, so Capture One interface, uh, we are gonna start with Guillaume's uh, shot of, I think it's a lighthouse, but I can't really see the light thing on top of it. Um, let's just have a little, little look. Yeah, I think it is a lighthouse. A um, little bit of a challenge getting to it. Um, and let's look at the, the way that we approach um, editing. So a lot of you have asked this in terms of, is there like a checklist? um of processes that, that everyone goes through for a, uh, for each sort of image and the answer is no because it depends on the type of image you're talking about but in this case um in, in especially in landscapes and cityscapes what you'll tend to find is it's it's ruled by first off lens correction second off the crop um, and the framing and then thirdly any image adjustments that tends to be the order um, and you'll see that order is something that we, we tend to do quite a lot um, in these sessions. Sometimes we'll come in afterwards and worry about the crop a little bit later. Um, but in general terms, it's actually the crop that I use first um, to decide what I'm going to do with the shot uh, in terms of editing. So a lot of people will say edit the whole shot and then crop it down. Personally, that doesn't always make sense to me because I may make a different artistic decision based on what the crop looks like before... Um, well, sorry, as a result of that, rather than um, editing the whole picture and then worrying about the crop later. So 
Let's go have a look around this picture. So number one, it's sharp. That's good. Um, we're just going to load in the lens profile. So it doesn't have a lens loaded for this one. I think it was a Nikon lens of some sort. Um, we're just going to get some corrections loaded in. So chromatic aberration, fine. Um, we might turn on diffraction correction just because it was shot at f10. Um, there may not be much of a difference there, but um, let's just do it for safety. And then let's have a look in here. We've got a little bit of fringing here. I'm not sure whether purple fringing is going to fix this necessarily. No, not necessarily. So in this case, we may have to stick with um, some of that just as a, a byproduct. But to be honest, even when we're zoomed in at 100%, you're not going to notice it in this shot. Okay, so then let's talk about crop. Um, and the crop on this one, it, while it's quite exciting that we've got this um, wave sort of coming in here, and uh, I think Guillaume's just said it should be red. I'm guessing you're referring to the... Uh, to the lighthouse um, so we'll, we'll try and fix that in a second as well um, but the the whole feel of this thing yes this is really interesting and I'm sure it was when you were there shooting it but as a print on the wall I don't think this is adding much to that shot and if I went quite dramatic and said actually let's go from a presumably this is a two by three um, aspect let's have a little little look yeah and let's switch that to a one by two so a full panoramic so twice as wide as it is long um, and then hit to about there. I'm going to fix that in a second. What I'm looking at is, is that lighthouse in the center, but not quite central. That's fine. And I'm also going to use the straightening tool, which is up here, and just draw a line across this horizon to make sure we're straight as well, which we are. And press the um, arrow key to hit it, or we can hit enter. It'll do exactly the same thing. To me, that crop... If I just clone that variant and let's just reset. So from there, it's a wonderful picture, great location. That feels more like a print to me. And this lead in here of these waves is a lot more powerful without the distraction of this one that's slightly uneven here on the side. So to me, and this is why I say to a lot of people, when we're talking about crops, yes, it's great to edit the whole picture and then make the crop decision later. But I'm going to make some very different decisions now based on seeing this crop and now picturing it on a wall. So let's uh, let's fix the stuff that's quite obvious. Um, so this wave down here now doesn't make sense because we don't have the rest of it. I didn't want to crop in any tighter. So instead of getting rid of uh, that in the crop, we're just going to use our healing tool. So new healing tool, healing brush there. Um, because I don't have a healing layer already made in the picture, I'm just going to draw a healing area over here. And Capture One is going to make a new layer. You can see it at the top left saying Heal Layer 1 and it's going to decide where to get the content to heal this bit from and it's made a guess of over here i'm going to override that guess by dragging this little um dot let's go to about there no oh, maybe it was more right than me to start with uh let's have a look that looks pretty good there okay so all we've done there is used Capture One's Auto Heal. So if I click on this heal brush now on the same layer, I can click on another area if I wanted to get rid of this wave, for example. Uh, let's just go here. It's going to choose a different area to pick that wave from and heal it out. Um, if I want to choose where the origin is going to be for this point, then I can just drag the origin around. But just remember that that point there has no impact on this point here. So they're all independent, even though they're on the same layer. And this is a big change in 20.1. Before you'd have to do a different layer for every single direction of heel. Now we can just drag each heel independently on any layer. We can draw as many heels as we like. I'm just gonna undo those, get rid of them. Um, okay, so David has just asked, what tools automatically make new layers? Um, so if you go to, it, it's not a case of they automatically, to be very careful with this, they will automatically create the first of their type. So if I create a new gradient layer or gradient mask using this tool here, and I don't already have a gradient layer selected, it will create a new adjustment layer with that gradient mask on. If I leave the, so let's say I'm on a brush now and I'm on my heel layer and so on, and I go to a brand new gradient here, and start drawing, it's gonna go to the top or the first grad existing gradient mask again and overwrite it. So you have gotta be really careful with this on relying on the auto create of a layer. It sounds stupid that they've, they've automated it. I still do this manually a lot of the time, which is I will still go into Capture One and say, add a new empty adjustment layer, so no mask, 
and then choose my tool. And it's simply because I've got complete control over what each layer is doing and then we'll label that layer so we know what it's for. Um, the same with the healing layer. So if I now go back to my healing brush, even though I'm on background, and start drawing a heel, it's going to go back to that heel layer. If, however, I, let's just undo that, if I create a new heel layer, and I'm on my background, and start drawing a brush, it's going to go, just like with gradient, to the topmost one of that type of layer. So that's why, unfortunately, the question is a little bit, <laughs> a little bit complicated. Um, so basically, heel layer, clone layer, and the gradient layers will create their own first layer. But if you go back to one of those tools, it will always overwrite or add to the uppermost one of that type of layers if they already exist. If they don't exist, it'll create its own. So that's a very complicated answer to what was a simple question, but unfortunately, that's the way that it works. Um, okay, so we've got our heel layer that's fixed that wave there. There's nothing more really to heal in there. Um, but Guillaume just mentioned that the, you know, the lighthouse should be more red, and I, I agree. There's another thing in here, which is the white balance seems a little bit off. Let me just come off of my um, healing brush. It's going to heal away all the waves. Um, it feels a little bit green, um, just in, in tone. So what I'm tempted to do, let's go to my exposure tab, which is this one here. And this is where all of our controls are going to be. I'm going to go back to the background layer. So be, keep a very strong eye on which layer you've got selected. If you're on your healing layer, most of this is going to be disabled. If you're on a gradient layer, you could be making changes and not noticing anything because you haven't masked the area you're, you're looking at. So back to the background, or you could create a new filled adjustment layer if you want to leave your background alone. But for now, let's go to our background and let's pick an area that we believe to be white. That's actually gone even more yellowy green. Hmm, we may have to do a bit of a manual one here if we can't get it looking quite right. Remember, we don't have to be looking at pure sort of um, wave white stuff. If we know where there's a bit of concrete that should be grey, there we go, that's a bit better. So our concrete is on the grayscale. Um, it's obviously from white to black. It's relatively neutral, um, so we can use that as a picker as well in that tool. And that's just removed some of the green tint that we had to some of this water down here, which is what I was looking for. And then let's have a look at our lighthouse itself. So as Guillaume says, should be more red. Um, I agree. So let's create a new empty adjustment layer. And this one we're going to do a manual mask. And I'm going to call it Lighthouse Red, obvious reasons. Uh, let's go to our brush tool. So select here for brush or up here for brush. Right click anywhere and you can change your brush settings. Or you can also go into your settings um, along the, the toolbar. Okay, so we can go into here and we can pull those same things up. But for now, I'm just going to go here, make the size a little bit bigger, nice soft edge, 100% opacity in this case, because it doesn't really matter. We're only going to be affecting the reds once I've done this change. So I'm just going to paint. Um, because I turned something off, you're not going to see where I painted. I'm going to fix that in a second. So to see the mask, we press M on the keyboard for mask. The reason that it wasn't showing when I was painting is I pressed the M to turn it off before I started painting, um, but now it's back on, so we can see that there. Now, we've got a very, very rough area in here, and if I were to turn the mask off like that, and let's go to our color editor, so on the color tab up here on the left, basic color editor is fine in this case, and if I say wanted to, well, in fact, let's show you why we're doing it in the color editor first. If I just change our saturation, yes, it changes it for that lighthouse, but it also changes it for everything else I drew. So I've then got to draw around the lighthouse or even do a Luma mask, but that's not going to pick up all of the different colors or different shades of red from dark to light. So instead of that, we edit the color rather than the entire mask. Now on the color editor, we can just choose our picker tool here, pick out this color, and it's gone to red, obviously. And then we can choose the reds and we can make them a bit more saturated a little bit lighter so don't overdo this stuff that's where it starts looking wrong but if you look at what that's done it is now changed only the red and only on this bit that I drew so if there's any red outside of this area and there, there isn't really but maybe it might pick up some of this stuff here maybe just maybe it would change that as well and it would make the saturation also increase up to 28 and the lightness increase to 9.5 so by masking this area, we're saying restrict what you're doing, Capture One, to only this area here in red. 
And when you've done that, I want you only to change the red tones. And if I were to undo that, that's without, and redo it, that's with. So it's relatively subtle. We don't want it to stand out like a sore thumb. We, we want it to look a little bit subtle, a little bit, uh, well, at least mostly natural. Um, but we can get it to stand out a bit more with lightness, to be honest, than sharpening. But now we've got our nice red lighthouse. So if I go with before and after, and of course, I can use the before and after tool up here on the top right. Um, so we can use that slider and say there's after, there's before, or there's halfway through, and we can see the difference. It's a subtle change, but yes, it's made the lighthouse a lot more red. Okay, then uh, on top of all of that, what we can do is we can probably make this sky even more dramatic than it is with a little boost of clarity up here. And in fact, I don't mind it affecting the sea. So in this case, we'll go back to our exposure tab here, go to clarity, and let's just wind that up a bit there. Oops, sorry. Ha, I just made my own mistake that I told you guys about. So look what's happened. The clarity has only affected that mask that I drew here because I was selected the wrong layer. So we're not going to undo that. <laughs> let's go back to our background. Or in fact, let's do it properly. We can create a filled adjustment layer. So that means everything is going to be applied to everything on the image because it's filled. And we're going to call this one clarity just so I can remember. And with this one now affecting the whole image, we can now increase clarity. That's better. We can actually see the difference now. Okay, and then finally, and it's very rare that I do this. I know um, David Grover and I have done a few of these um, where you know he's, he's added a vignette in there. Um, vignettes were, were seen uh, to go very much out of fashion a long time ago um, because it was a sign of a bad lens. Basically, if, if you had light fall off on your lens, it was because it wasn't made very well. It was good to have edge-to-edge -edge lightness. Um, and it was a very traditional way of, of creating focus in the center of the image. In this case, I want to create say, or focus in the center of the image. So why not just boost that center there a little bit with a bit of vignetting? Because I've now brought the corners down, I can afford now with brightness to pull the whole image up. And if that's not enough for me, I could also do it with curves and levels. So we could take our levels and push that there. And then we can actually afford then even more to pull down these corners into here. And there we go. So we go from there to there in a very short number of steps. Um, we've made the lighthouse stand out more. Um, we, that crop actually adds a lot more drama to this um, than the original out here. Out here, you know, it's framed well, it's shot well, there's nothing wrong with this image. Um, it's just if you were thinking about a print on a wall, this is just going to feel a lot more dramatic and a lot more impactful. Okay, uh, let's shift across to a shot from William. I love this shot. This is cool. Um, so I'm, well, I'm not sure exactly where it was, um, but I've seen similar shots that we did out in uh, South Africa. And the, the light, when you get this time of day, the light is stunning, especially if you can get a shot like this, which is framed so well. Um, so there's a couple of changes on here. To be honest, the colouring on this is spot on. I don't really want to change anything about that. Um, all I'm tempted to do is just to fix some of the fur on, on the giraffe and also a little bit of a crop change. And I'll show you why in a second. And there's um, a little distraction that we're going to fix too. So first off, as always, lens uh, is loaded in the right profile for this Sigma lens. We're going to get it to analyse this exact image um, with that exact combination of lens and camera. Um, I'm not worried about diffraction. We're at f3.5, so a nice wide um, aperture. Uh, there's a nice long lens as well. Um, so let's. No, no, actually, we could push a little bit. Of, there's a bit of light fall off that's gone on on this lens. So when I was talking about the opposite of vignetting just before, um, we can we, we can actually see here. If you have a look, we've got a lot of brightness here, especially in this sky, and then it darkens off out towards the edges. So I'm just going to increase that light fall off slider until that fall off disappears. So it's now a much more even sky and that's in the lens correction rather than vignetting. So a couple of things on here. Number one, the crop. Um, I'm going to go to our original and I just want to lose some of this space here. Um, and that's for two reasons. One, I want to get rid of this lump here, which is a bit distracting on the corner of the frame. Two, I really want this to fit um, a little more evenly into the frame. So if I go to about there, that just feels closer. You're, you're just more involved with the scene. So especially when we're focused on such a big animal in such a, a frame, it's good just to bring the viewer a little bit tighter if we can. 
Now, there's another thing down here, this one, um, which is a little bit distracting, just this dark, I think it's a shadow of some sort, um, but we'll, we'll have a look at trying to remove that. But first off, before we do any of that, let's just go right into the giraffe. And if I zoom into 200%, which is a little bit unfair, we've got this cool little bird sat there um, on his neck. Um, now, we did a session on this on one of the pro tips things about structure and clarity and so on. Um, and in this one, we're dealing with fur and I want to play with structure just to show you what that's going to do in terms of the difference to the um, to the shot. So <clears throat> remember, um, for those of you that have seen that pro tips, we refer to it like an onion. So effectively, clarity is the outer skin. It's the, the big areas, the big contrast changes around the midtones, especially. That's where it has its most effect. Structure is more about um, texture and detail, um, especially in things like animal fur and skin and, and so on. And then sharpening, so overall sharpening, is about edges, so lines and edges and sharp details like that. I don't want to really affect the edges too much in this. What I want to affect is the texture and the detail in the structure of the fur. So that's exactly what structure does. We're going to leave the method on natural. Um, if you want to see what a difference some of these ones make, um, and it's quite dramatic, um, have a look at that pro tips thing on, on YouTube because uh, it'll actually show you um, how dramatic that change can be if you select the wrong method. Um, but in this case, I'm just going to pull structure up a touch, not too much, just a bit, and look at the difference we've got in this neck. So if I turn this off and on, then we've got a fantastic amount of change in, in the texture that's coming into his fur. However, look at what it's done down here. We've added this bit of haloing. So if I just do the undo again, so there was a slight dark line there around the edge of his neck. But look, it's now a much darker line. So this is where we've got a, a trade-off to play. So structure is a nice one-stop shop for this, but actually sharpening may help us even more because sharpening has got this extra slider, halo suppression. So in this case, I'm going to increase our sharpening. Obviously, that increases the halo as well around here. But I'm going to turn up our halo suppression slider until it's gone again. And then I can actually push this a bit more. We can push our threshold down a bit to get more texture. So again, if I undo, you can see there, and redo, you can see the sharpening effect. Now, we're at 300 and 400% and so on. At 100%, this is going to be a relatively subtle change. So that's without. And that's with you can definitely see the difference so again without and with but when you're printing these things you know i i, I get the theory that everyone tries to look at these things at 100 percent have a look at 200 percent every now and then because typically when you print something especially if you print it big people will go up you you, you know we all do it ourselves we go up to a picture and we have a look closely um and we'll forgive the fact that the picture has got you know artifacts in there and maybe some pixelation what we won't forgive is over sharpening so if you start seeing those halo lines just be really careful have a look at 200 percent and make your decisions from there and then come back for the overall image okay so that's the one change that we've made on our background layer not, i'm really not going to change anything in terms of the white balance the white balance is spot on on this in this shot it's the right feel for it it's just that bit down there that's a little bit um a little bit distracting so We've got two ways of dealing with this. We could do a healing um, brush. So let's just heal that area there and see where Capture One chooses the, uh, the place from. And it's probably not quite right. So I'm gonna drag that origin to maybe another out of focus bit here. But you know, see down here, it's, it's not quite right. It hasn't quite got it um, spot on. So instead of the healing brush, what we're gonna do is we're going to have a normal brush i'm going to create a adjustment layer and we're going to call it um, shadow removal and with this one i'm going to put my opacity right the way down so those of you that that know me and, and have been around for a while um, you'll know that i play with opacity some people play with flow there is no right or wrong answer in this um, it's just what you prefer or what your preference is um, and how you can sometimes um, see the image so i'm just going to turn my mask on and just start painting in here very softly just building up the layers so if I were to turn my mask to a grayscale mask you'd be able to see we've got that lovely fall off where it's starting to um, to have no effect I'm going to turn that mask off and with this mask so just like we did before with our color editor I can choose my area in here choose this part and say we're going to increase that saturation but increase the lightness as well 
again they're all small tiny small steps that's looking pretty good there we've got an extra bit down here so what I'm going to do instead is go to my advanced tab I'm actually going to undo that go to my advanced tab because I need to grab more of the color than I realized so this allows me to pick that color but then say actually anything in this color range here I want to increase the saturation but most importantly increase the lightness good and now I'm going to use my eraser tool so this tool here and let's just zoom in here so I know that my mask goes further than I needed so with my eraser tool set to probably about 30 or 40 percent we can start erasing parts of the mask that I didn't want to affect out to there now what I can also do with this layer is I can change its color <laughs> so we can go all the way to magenta or we can go all the way to green so I'm just going to move that hue until we find one that more matches or matches more closely the yellows around it that's looking pretty good there maybe a touch more in lightness we can get away with there touch more in saturation not too much that's looking pretty good okay it's not quite spot on to be honest we probably spend a little more time on this um, to do it properly but we just want to get rid of that shadow um, the harshness of it we'll just spend a bit more time later on um, just fixing that bottom part and you can see the way that we're going to do that um, but it's going to get you to a place where we don't notice that shadow so much as long as we're uh, relatively soft around the edges and blend it in quite nicely okay okay so to me that's all we need to do with this shot um you know the the tree branches are intentionally out of focus it's, it's quite a shallow aperture um, that's being used um the the animal is perfectly in focus all we've done is we've increased the the texture and the detail in the animal's skin and the fur and that's also had the effect of bringing out this bird a little bit better as well the crop obviously is a bit different um and it just goes from out here with this um here to just being tighter um, and just more focused on the animal itself. Okay, uh, oh, I think this was a shot from uh, last week, maybe even the week before. Um, so let's have a little look. It's a nice scene, lovely scene um, out on the beach. We've got a lot of dust spots up here. <laughs> um, so we'll do some quick um, edits with those in a second. But again, let's go to our lens. Good, we've got that in. At f22, I definitely want some diffraction correction in there because the chances are it's going to be there. Um, it's a very, very deep depth of field, but unfortunately, f22, you're also going to lose some of the sharpness um, in the shot. Um, and this mist really isn't helping out here with that house. So first off, again, same principle for me as before. I want to worry about the cropping and the framing first. Um, there's a weird thing going on here where we've almost got it looks like the sea is up and then the sea comes down which is a little bit odd because generally sea level tends to be um, level um, oh let's just go sorry we've got a question on the previous one Simon uh, would you brighten the giraffe's eye a little bit we can um, the challenge that I've got with this is that the eye is dark um, if we if we brighten it much more we've, we've got a little catch light in the eye which is great this here i think is probably a fly we might we might choose to get away i'll get rid of that one um just while we're at it and we just turn our opacity up with the healing brush um just create a little heel there there um so for his eye we, we can i mean let's see what it does um so let's, let's create a new layer called eye with our brush um and i'm going to choose this section here so you can see it to make sure we're only affecting that eye i'm going to go to a luma range and say only affect everything that's dark not the skin around so there and there and then with this we could pull up our exposure a touch i just want to be really careful that it doesn't look fake um, and that, that's what worries me with this a little bit um yeah don't, don't worry pablo we killed the fly um, was, um so fly's gone uh, so that's with it that's with it lightened um i mean to be honest with without um that's going to be personal choice but yeah absolutely you can with that just quick method so just literally draw around the eye um choose a luma range to affect only the darkest parts um and then you could bring that up but to me i, I don't think it's necessary on there if anything we might have to um, blend it in a little bit more let me pull my opacity down on the eraser so I'm just going to erase the mask around it as well just to soften that line 
Um, but yeah, it, it can work. Um, it's just down to um, down to personal preference. Okay, so uh, oh, back on the beach. Um, let's start off by trying to do a straighten. So straightening tool up here, we draw it along the horizon. What worries me is our horizon is a little bit weird in this shot. But let's go to there. Let's trust that that's okay. I am going to change the crop on this one as well. Uh, it's a definite one by two day um, today because this down here in the foreground isn't helping me too much. And thinking about it when this was shot, if the reason for using F22 was to get everything in focus from right down here at my feet all the way through to that hut, if I'd planned, if, and this is again, it's personal preference, but for me, this feels more like a panoramic shot. So I'd want to make it that way like this. Because my first focal point is way out here now, I could have got away with F11 or F16 if I wanted to and still have the same depth of field by focusing further out. So sometimes, as I say, sometimes there's cropping decisions. You can make them at the point of capture and it might change some of the settings that you use. And that's why, to me, it's crop first. Think about that and then think about um, some of the artistic changes that you might put in. Um, these dust spots up here, we could use the dust spot tool. So that's found under the healing brush. You've got remove spot. Um, but to be honest, recently I've just switched to using healing brush for all the dust spots. Um, it just does a better job. Uh, make sure it's at 100% opacity. Bring your size up a little bit and just draw little circles around those spots. And generally speaking, Capture One does a very good job now of, of choosing the, uh, the origin point and all good. So that's our healing brush there. And we can actually call this one dust spots. If you want a cool way of finding dust spots in your image, again, go on to the YouTube channel we've got and there's a dust spot finder um, tool uh, that we can show you how to do very quickly. So the rest of it in this shot, do you know, the white balance is off, but this is one where I like it. Um, it feels right. Um, so Claudio's just asked, um, you love your one by two crops, why not 16 by nine? It depends um, is the answer and it depends on what you're producing for. We typically, well, I, from, from that perspective, I typically produce for print um, and we're printing in effectively standard frame sizes. So when you're dealing with people putting works of art on a wall, there are certain accepted norms. So a two by one panoramic is, is normal. A three by four is fine. A two by three is fine. 16 by nine is great for screen, but it's useless in a lot of cases when you try and put it on a wall. The, the aspect ratio is slightly wrong. It's 1.7777 recurring. Um, it feels a little bit weird um, because it's not quite panoramic. Um, and actually, if you think think about it, even when you go to the cinema, so if you go to the, the movies and you watch a so-called widescreen TV or widescreen movie, it's not even then shot in 16 by 9. There's still black bars top and bottom. It's still done in a um, panoramic or anamorphic way. Um, so to me, there in my head, there are certain crops that work very well for print, um, and 16 by 9 is just definitely not one of them. Um, Yes, Marcus just said the yuck delete layer, um, the dust spot removal layer. Yes, so we'll, we'll show you in one of those YouTube, have a look in the YouTube video and you'll learn how to make your own yuck delete layer. Um, so dust spots are all gone. Um, as I say, I like the white balance in this shot. If I were to change this, if I did anything with this, let's, let's have a look. Let's make it warmer. Mm, it just looks a bit dirtier now. If I add some tint into it, it's just going too pink. If I make it cooler, it starts to look like moonlight, um, but that doesn't feel right. Honestly, the way that it was shot is a really nice pastel tone. So quite often we'll go to white balance first, but just don't be afraid. And if, if the camera's got it right in the first place, then stick with it. Um, it's, this is a this is a pretty good example of that. Now, to bring out some of the detail in this structure out here, this um, house or building, I'm going to draw just a little layer, an empty one, and call it structure building. And even though I've called it structure, we're actually going to use clarity. So I'm going to go to my brush tool. 100% opacity is fine uh, in this case. And I'm just going to draw roughly around the building. And it's the areas of the building and the rock that I want to deal with. I'm also then going to reduce my opacity down and feather that out as we come off of the building. So we've got a nice slow taper for when that starts to take effect. So we don't notice the buildings having its maximum effect. Um, cool. For those, some, someone's just joined from the Philippines. Dan is in the Philippines. It's really late there, but good evening. Um, so let's uh, let's just finish that taper off. So if I switch to a grayscale mask so you can see, it looks pretty rough, but it's, it's preventing that hard line um, of where we put in some clarity and where it stops. 
So by using the clarity slider, let's go up to 100% so you can see the effect. That's brought it out really nicely. It's a bit too much. It's going to stand out too much from the rest of the picture. So we're going to pull it down to maybe 30 or 40. And all we're doing is just having the effect. If I do a before and after here, so that's without and that's with, you'll just notice this is a bit more prominent. That's, that's all it is. It's just to make it stand out just a tiny little bit more. Um, now, for the rest of it, we're going to do two layers uh, which are going to combine together to give us the effect that I want. So the first layer is going to be our bottom. So I'm going to create a new empty adjustment layer. I could have just created the gradient and it would create the layer like I explained earlier. But for um, clarity or for, for keeping it clean um, sake, we're going to call it a bottom grad. And I'm going to draw a gradient line along there. So a really, really soft fall off here. And I want it to affect here more than down here. And with that line, I'm going to pull my exposure down just a touch. So about a quarter of a stop, not a lot. Um, pull my saturation up a bit and I'm going to pull my clarity down. But look at that difference. So if I pull clarity up, look at the detail in the sea. Pull clarity down. That's too much, but you see how all the detail has gone. So I want to pull it down by maybe 30 to 40, something like that, just to smooth this out. And then we're going to create another empty adjustment layer. And this one we call Sky Grad. And with this one, I'm going to pull, as you can imagine, another graduated filter down here. I don't want it to affect this house too much, so it's going to stop about there. Remember, this middle line on the graduated filter is the 50% mark. So 100% mask, 50% mask, 0% mask. So wherever that line is, is going to have only half the effect of what it did here, but but 50% more, obviously, than what it has here. With that layer, I'm going to do some highlight recovery just to pull the sky in. And why it's now, you can see now why we'd only want to do it on this layer here. I don't want to do that down here because I'm going to lose more detail. So with that done, I can then pull up some clarity. I'm just going to make the sky pop a little bit more and pull down our exposure a touch again. So down 23, let's say. What this means is I've got almost a triangle. So I've got a darkened area here. I've got a darkened area here. I can afford to pull some saturation up a little bit in that sky. And this area now is fully the focus in that picture. And because of that, I can go back to my background layer now and I can pull my contrast up because I can afford to do that a little bit more now. And we could actually play with our levels now on the background. So let's pull that down. So the brightest parts are going to get brighter. The darkest parts are going to get darker. Um, Pablo's just asked, why not use a Luma range here? Um, simply because um, I want to affect all of this sky. So with all of that sky being affected, um, the Luma range doesn't really make much difference. Um, if, I, if I only wanted to affect, let's say, this bright part of the sky up here, then yes, the Luma range is going to help. But here it's not. And I don't want to not affect some of um, the other areas down here. So if I did a Luma range on the bright parts, well, it doesn't it doesn't then affect any of this stuff here. And I want that fall off to look like a natural filter was used. Um, so from there, now what's also happened, as you can see, as a result of introducing a lot more clarity, we can see a few more dust spots up here. Um, so again, that dust spot finder layer would have helped. But for now, let's just fix them real quick. Uh, so they go away and they're not distracting. Okay, and that's probably about it. So let's just reset. So there's our original. Nothing wrong with this shot. It's just, again, it's personal preference. To me, that feels more like a wall print. Um, and in fact, I could even... I just found another another dust spot. Um, whose image was this? This is Earl's. Earl's. Oh, Earl. We need, we need to talk about your, uh, your lens cleaning. Um, just out of interest, for, for one thing to bear in mind, one of the reasons you're seeing so many dust spots is this f22. Um, so if you shoot an ultra wide uh, aperture, so you know 2.84, 5.6 even, um, you won't see as many dust spots because they're not actually in focus at all. They're, they're just a blur on the front of the lens. The second you start going into very small apertures, so you know f16, f22, f32, I've seen. Um, you'll see that more and more and more artifacts on the front of the lens or the filter or whatever start to appear on your picture. Um, so that's another another warning thing for there. What I would actually be tempted to do with this one, though, now we've done that, is come in even tighter with the crop. And I'm almost into this place here because I'm not sure that this bit of sky up here is helping much in that image. Um, and again, so to me, that feels um, just a bit nicer as a, as a wall print. Okay, um, 
Ian, uh, this was, uh, you said it was somewhere down south, I think. Um, it's maybe it's in Dorset or something. I'm, I'm not sure. Dorset, Hampshire, somewhere around that. Um, first off, let's make sure we've got a lens profile in. Great. Um, we're at f11, and there's probably not much diffraction going on in here. We're looking pretty sharp, even out of the edges. Um, have we got any fringing to worry about? Um, so fringing you're going to find at the high contrast points in the image, and actually you've managed to escape it here um, pretty well. Um, uh, David's saying the crud's on the sensor, not on the lens. Um, it well, it'll de it'll depend. Um, I don't know. Is that your shot, David? I'm not sure. Um, okay. Um, if you're sure, then okay. Um, it may well be on the lens. Um, but either way, yeah, let's um, let's let's sort it out. Um, so Ian's just saying it's Romney Marsh in Kent. Um, cool place. Okay, and you got lucky with the mist. So uh, let's do a little um, little change. So I don't really now. Let's think about what we could do here. So number one, the crop is fine. Um, we've got a nice lead in here on this diagonal. I don't want to crop up here. I don't want to crop down there. We don't want to change the aspect ratio. So it's perfectly fine as it is. Um, what I do want to do is pull out a bit more color up here in the sky because we can see there's more color up here, but it's just been washed a little bit with the um, the mist getting in the way. Um, and maybe make less of this down here. Now, the problem with making less of that, you know, the, the default thing a lot of people will do is they'll create a new gradient layer like this. And the way that you make less of things, you make them darker, right? Well, here's the problem. Um, if you make something like this darker in this shot, you're making the image or that area of the image even more contrasty than, than it was before. So if the rest of the image is washed out, if you remember what your eye looks for, your eye is looking for contrast and shapes more than anything. So if you create more contrast in an area you're trying to get rid of or, or try and move the viewer away from, you risk losing the actual subject of the photo. So if I were to just turn this off, I'm not sure which one actually has less of an impact and which one draws my focus to it more i'm going to do that i'm going to leave it on but maybe only half of that so we've got this opacity up here remember so with that layer created i can call that layer foreground and even though i've done it with exposure i could just halve the exposure in here but for now just to demonstrate it we're going to do it with opacity so opacity of that layer is now only 50 percent of anything you do down here that softened it away from the viewer for sure, but it hasn't added too much contrast, so it's not now um, standing out quite so much as it was before. Let's create a new layer, uh, and that layer is going to be called Sky. Again, gradient layer. Now remember, it's just like the question that was happening earlier, or that came up earlier, if I leave it on foreground and start painting a new gradient mask, it's going to replace the gradient mask that I have on the foreground. I don't want to do that. So especially on these tools where they auto create layers, this is why I do it manually, because I want control over which layer I'm doing the gradient on or which layer I'm doing the healing on. So for me, I'd create the empty layer and then go to the gradient tool um, afterwards. And because I know I'm going to pull out some clarity and some detail up here, I don't want this to affect the mist here. So that if you remember, if I create, or in fact, let's do it on back, or background now so you can see it. If I do a load of clarity work, I'm going to lose some of the mist. That doesn't really work. So as a result, that's the worst thing I can do for this area here. But that's what I want to do up here. So we're going to go to our sky and we're going to create a new gradient layer that only affects this upper sky and doesn't affect the mist here. The mist we want to keep. So clarity is the worst thing we could do um, to that area because you're going to lose all of the, uh, the mistiness. Uh, Jan's just asking, my lens is not available. What's the best setting? So um, generally speaking in lens correction, if your lens is available, um, it'll come up there. If for whatever reason um, Capture One gets a bit confused, sometimes it can give you a list of possible recommended lenses because it's not sure on the EXIF data. Or if you're 100% sure you've got the right lens, but it hasn't loaded it in automatically, you can obviously load it in from the lens profile list. Some cameras will load in what's called a manufacturer profile, where the camera is actually embedded the file with the manufacturer profile for that lens, in which case, great, it will already have its chromatic aberration. That's the equivalent, or as near as you can get, to having a lens profile loaded in. If it hasn't got either of those, it will default to generic. And generic, unfortunately, doesn't have some of the automatic stuff in there, but you can still do chromatic aberration corrections. You can still fix diffraction. 
you can still do light fall off and so on it's just not going to be calibrated to that specific lens it's going to be a more general effect um, so those are the three modes uh, the correct profile loaded in a manufacturer profile or generic um, if neither of those apply so with the sky layer up here we're going to pull down our highlights that's going to get a lot of the color back in HDR I'm going to pull down those whites a little bit and we're going to increase our clarity of touch just to get a bit of a pop in the sky up there it's pretty nice um, and then down here we could actually I'm going to leave that as it is because that's looking pretty nice as it is already we don't remember the key thing here is we want to keep this mist the mist is the most important part of this image um, so then we have a question as to whether or not we can pull the entire focus into this tree line and one of the ways we can do that with the sky is to pull that exposure down um, again not too much I'm not sure Ian if you had a graduated filter on here already um, but if you didn't or if you did um, and it was relatively light obviously we can put on effectively an equivalent graduated filter because your shot has enough dynamic range to do it if your shot is overexposed or underexposed a filter in capture one or in, in reality isn't going to help you um, it's just going to bring up noise or, or bring down overexposed um, highlights to be gray rather than white that doesn't help but if you've got enough dynamic range in your histogram already using these uh, layers with a graduated filter and then pulling exposure is the equivalent of using a graduated ND um, on there okay so with that done um, I'm tempted a little bit with this one to play a touch with the white balance um, and it's just to make it a little cooler so we've got a bit more mist or misty feeling and move that tint up a little bit there now then I come down to remember I said to begin with the crop is fine as a result of doing those changes up there what's distracting me now is this down here and I do wonder whether we could get away with putting the crop mark to there instead of here now that's going to be an interesting one because let's go to our original aspect ratio and see how much we're going to lose as a result of doing that because I don't really want to lose this river up here um, so we may get to there maybe even right to there I'm trying to avoid going to another one by two um, that's looking pretty good there and then this part down here all I'm going to do is we're just going to add a new layer and call it grass focus something like that and with my tool we're just going to do that leave it at a relatively low opacity and blend in some little mask adjustments um, so again with opacity every time I click we get another layer oops move the uh, move the screen around there uh, we get another layer of that opacity building up so if I switch to a grayscale mask you can see the effect that's having so it's quite light out here and it gets bolder and bolder and bolder as we get into the corner and with that area there I could now pull down our exposure and also pull down our shadows because remember shadows is affecting this area here um, without affecting the highlighted parts and that just brings the focus away from this part down here so if I show you again with and without so we can see it there before we've got this quite um, light area especially where it's on the edge of the frame so you're going to see it quite obviously if you print this and here it's sort of disappeared out overall with our background we could afford just a bit to push some saturation just to get that little pop of the pink up there and to me that's sort of done um, so again let's clone that variant so we can have a look so there's before there's after obviously we've made that white balance change that's going to be one of the big things but this change here and removing this just brings that focus more to these trees here um, than this bank that was out here on the left if we're not happy with that um, white balance of course we can warm it back up uh, we can get to sort of there that's pretty nice there um, or you can go back to the original as shot white balance too and that works as well um, if by the way uh, we wanted to make these trees stand out even more just for fun let's um, create a new layer we'll call this one trees and with our trees layer I'm gonna draw it's gonna be a bit weird um, a radial grad like this I'm just gonna stretch that there with a really soft fall off good so you can see the mask there uh, I'm actually gonna make that a little smaller there and with this mask I'm going to invert it so in other words affect only this part here 
Now, with that mask area inverted, remember high dynamic range. We usually use it to pull shadows up and we use it to pull blacks up. In this case, we can pull these sliders down. And by pulling them down, they're going to become more contrasty without using the contrast tool. If I use the contrast tool, yes, the blacks and these silhouettes here will get darker, but also our highlights will get lighter. And I don't want that. I want to leave the highlights where they were. So this allows me just to focus on the shadow and the black section of the histogram. I could, of course, do it with a curve on this layer. So I could pull down the shadows specifically there. It's going to have a bit of an effect down here that I don't want. So because we've got this overlap here. So what I can then do is go to my eraser tool, click. It's going to say, do you want to rasterize the mask? So once I've done this, I cannot um, change the gradient filter anymore. I'm going to increase the size of this, increase the opacity of it. And we're just going to lose all of the bits of that gradient, that radial gradient, that I don't want to be affected by this. But you'll see now, if I turn this mask off and on, the difference that has on the trees. And again, because of opacity, I can pull that effect down to nothing or up to, you know, 60, 70%, something like that, um, just to give it a bit more pop. So again, we go from there to there. It looks pretty nice. Cool. Okay. Um, next one. Uh, oh, yeah. So Tan sent two images in. Um, one, it's such a shame, but I'm going to show you why it's, it's a bit of a shame. So um, in this one, we've got the lens profile loaded in. Um, let's just do the analyzer chromatic aberration. Great. We're at F11. Uh, looks pretty dark. Um, I'm not sure a graduated filter was used. If it was, then it was used top and bottom at the same time. But the obvious thing to do here would be to pull up all of our shadows and blacks in the histogram. But look, we've got so much noise in those shadows and it's actually a little bit unsharp. Um, so in this one, I would love to be able to rescue it. Um, I'd love to you know, somehow be able to, um, to, to pull this up with no noise. Unfortunately, Han, I, I don't think we can in this case. Um, if I pull anything up, you know, even if I reset all of that and just pull up exposure, we're going to have the same problem. It's still soft and out of focus and we've still got um, some of these these parts of noise in here. So every now and then, you know, we, we try and push capture one to try and get as much as it can out of the dynamic range. If anything in this shot, it looks like, I mean, it was shot for 160th of a second at ISO 2500. You could have got away with a lot lower ISO. Um, for a lot longer shutter speed um, because you've got, I mean, you've got here almost half of your histogram with no data in here. So you weren't going to be at risk of exposing those highlights too much. We could have pulled the shadows up a bit more. And if we started with more data, when we go in and pull it up, it would have been better. That said, this one is a wonderful histogram with loads and loads of information and a cool bit of mist in the valley. So let's focus on this one instead. Um, I can't remember where you said this was, but these are tea plantations from my own experience they look like that um so let's have a look at what we can do first thing on here obviously lens correction so yeah fine diffraction correction i'm not too worried about on here it's pretty sharp let's just go into 100 percent in fact let's go into 200 percent or three yeah we're spot on in sharpness so all i'm going to do on here is just make sure it's loaded in the right lens profile and then go straight to our exposure tab now, with this image, we've got quite a flat, low contrast image. It's quite flat, low light. Um, so let's just get rid of that one so we're not focusing on there. And let's look at what we can do with that flat light. Well, the first thing is we can pull our levels. So we could do that. But obviously, that's going to shift the entire stretch of even the midtones as well up too. So we're making the brights brighter, the midtones brighter, and leaving the shadows where they were. That's not good enough in this one. In this case, we're going to have to use curves. So the reason is because I want to leave this mid-tone section kind of where it was and just pull up the very highlights of the image. So we're putting in like a, a little mini S-curve, um, not too much of an S in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, but let's just do a before there and after there. So by doing that, we've protected all of these shadows down here because we haven't moved them on this bottom part here. I've drawn another dot here Sort of, if you imagine this histogram didn't exist here, so rather than playing with, typically we play with the curve like the whole extent of it. In this case, there's no point in playing with it anything up here. If anything, as I bring up now the brightness, what you're going to see is that curve starts to populate more up here. Fine. 
So we're now going to pull down that mid-tone there, pull up this mid-tone. This becomes our highlight effectively. I'm not worried about anything up here because there's no data in the image that's even featuring there anyway. Um, but that's just given us a lot more contrast in this picture. If I go to before and after, there's before on the left and there's after here. So we've got all that detail back and these layers start to show up. So we've got these layers of tea plantations with the, or the fog and the mist in the background. Um, oh, Hans, oh, Tansa said, uh, from Cameron Highlands in Malaysia. Cool. Um, never been there. Looks kind of funky. Okay. Um, so with that done, what we've also done is brought up a lot of the detail into this cool um, sort of color range. I am going to come down from this top part here. This isn't really adding much up here, apart from this bright um, section, which is obviously where the sun was starting to break through. So with our crop, I'm going to leave it as original crop and just pull down to about here and to here. I want to keep this tree in completely and I want to keep this house in completely, but I'm not too worried about this half tree here on that side of the crop or the hill there. Um, so we go into there. And then with this, I'm going to warm it up a little bit. Um, so just to get us back to that nice sort of warm green feeling that you get with this sort of landscape, rather than that cool sort of moonlight um, that was there before. Now, obviously, we've got some huge brightness going on up here and then a lot of shadow down here. I'm going to even that up and I'm going to do it really, really quickly with just a simple gradient filter. So let's go down to there. Let's just see our mask. So press M on the keyboard again. And you can see the mask and press M to make it go away again. And with that, we're going to pull our exposure down just a touch, not too much. So about 0.2, so 0.2 of a stop. Um, just to keep the focus on this fog area in here. And then overall with the image, we can afford with this one to push some clarity in. And that's just going to make everything stand out. And again, clarity is focusing on areas and especially in those mid-tones and grays. So where we've moved a lot of that histogram up by using that curve, we're going to affect more of the mid-tones um, as a result of the clarity structure, or sorry, the clarity change. And we're going to end up pushing those mid-tones to decide whether they're either brighter or darker than the area next to them. And that's what gives you that contrast. Um, saturation, we don't need to really worry about too much. If anything, actually, that desaturation looked quite nice there just for a second on the background. It's pretty cool. We can pump a bit of contrast into this. And then I would almost be tempted just to pull in a little bit of, um, of gradient here just to keep the focus on that mist. So let's call that one sky, which it was. And I'm going to call another one left side. And with that, I'm just going to pull in a really soft gradient. So you can see there. In fact, I'm going to make it even softer there. And I'm not going to do much with it. Just pull it down a touch, like again, 0 0.2, 0 0.25, something like that. And that just gives us this whole sort of feel of, of moving into that scene, into this mist, um, rather than worrying about um, all of this stuff and all this detail down here. What I love is a photo where you have an initial point of reference. So in this case, this one here. And then as you start to explore it with your eyes, you can see more and more detail. And especially in this shot, let's just have a look down here. When you start looking at all these structures and all these plantations and all that sort of stuff, that's really cool. So if you can get that with a sort of one, two effect of a picture, number one, what's the big focus? It's this mist in the valley. Number two, oh, there's a lot of cool stuff out going on out here. Now, remember with this background, even with that curve change, I can still use our HDR tools. So I can still use shadow and I can still use black to pull these up a bit. When I do that, it has the effect of losing some contrast. So I'm going to counter that with our clarity tool to about there. So again, let's create a clone of that variant. So there's our original and there's our new. If that feels too harsh, then we just pull down that clarity and pull down that contrast to touch. That feels a bit better like that. Um, but again, if we go before and after, so where we're losing a lot of information and, and detail in here, it's all nice and vivid um, in this version here. Cool. Um, so that's probably where we're going to hit today. Um, there's some nice shots in there. So we've got uh, tea plantations in Malaysia. We've got Ian's cool um, trees, Earl's random uh, random uh, house by the sea, uh, William's cool giraffe with the bird, and Guillaume's first um, lighthouse um, with the, the sunken walkway. 
Um, so again, remember, um, I referenced some of the stuff um, in this session that there are pro tips things for. Have a look at the channel. You'll find in there things about um, dehazing images, finding dust spots, um, but also around clarity and structure. There's quite a long one on that. Um, and then remember as well, on top of all of that, you've also got that new Facebook group. For those of you that are using Facebook to watch this, please interact as much as you want in that group. The whole point of it is that it can be a place, place that we can discuss some of this after the original sessions, because obviously we don't get through all of the questions that come through. And also remember that we have got coming up, where are we there? Um, that session on Thursday with Teamwork, um, which is about the Phase 1 IQ4 and the cool stuff we can do with that sensor, um, which is pretty impressive or pretty impressive and incredible. Um, and then the next one of these is going to be next Tuesday, the 7th of July. Um, so same time um, as always, um, but then join in. Um, and in the meantime, send those images, um, the ones that you want editing through. Obviously, as you can see, we get through as many as we can. Um, but there are quite a lot more to get through. Um, but over the coming weeks, we'll, um, we'll certainly get through them as fast as we can. In the meantime, um, look after yourself and everyone else, and we'll catch you either Thursday or next week. Cheers, everyone. Bye.